This program is brought to you by Emory University. Okay, welcome back to our uh, final section of uh, the afternoon panel. Um, so far, conversation has been wonderful, and I imagine it'll get uh, only better. Um, we have had uh, Archbishop Gregory join us from the Archdiocese of Atlanta, and I'm going to ask Philip Thompson of the Aquinas Center for Theology uh, to introduce him. All right, well, I, I first got involved in this project uh, when, when Pat contacted me from Pitt's Theology and said, I just got the email and it said, we're going to do this project for the 500th year of the Reformation on has the Reformation failed? And then I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and we would like to invite a Catholic speaker, uh-oh. <laughs> and then he, then he said, and we think the Archbishop would be a great panelist. <laughs> and I said, me too. <laughs> um, we're very, I'm very happy to uh, introduce our Archbishop. And you'll notice I'm not going to use uh, Bishop, that flowery language that uh, Luther did to his bishop. Oh, your most high eminence and uh, so forth. Thank no. you. <laughs> I'll be glad to give you the notes. <laughs> Although it was impressive, I must say. Um, so we're very, very uh, thankful to have Archbishop Gregory here in the Archdiocese of Atlanta. And he has received all sorts of honorary degrees and awards. And just I'm going to posit that those, all those are there, and you, sh you can uh, be sure of that. But I'd like to focus on just a couple of quick things. One is he was elected president of the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops in 2001. And if you remember that, that's right when the priest's uh, sex scandals broke. So I'm sure he was very thankful that the bishops elected him at that time. <laughs> and uh, during his tenure, the, the, um, the bishops implemented and created the Charter for the Protection of Children and young people, which is really an outstanding document and program which has revolutionized the Catholic Church. But the leadership of Archbishop Gregory had everything to do with how the church found its way in that dark hour. The, the um, journalist John Allen was here on campus as our major uh, speaker, major Catholic speaker, and he's one of the leading Catholic journalists in the world. And he wasn't two minutes into his talk, Archbishop, before he said this. I'm a big fan of your Archbishop. I covered his work on the child abuse scandal. If the time ever comes that we launch a canonization process for Wilton Gregory, I will volunteer to give testimony on behalf of the Archbishop. <laughs> I think his performance during that time was nothing less than miraculous. He exuded compassion. He exuded concern. He exuded real competence. In short, the US bishops won the lottery by having him as their leader. He is a treasure, an enormous asset for the Catholic Church in the United States. And in 2004, that asset uh, came to Atlanta. And we have been very, very thankful to have him as our leader ever since. He has taken on difficult issues, whether it's immigration uh, or any host of issues uh, like capital punishment, which are not easy issues to take on as the Catholic Archbishop in a very red state. But he's been fearless in doing that. He's been fearless in keeping the different divisions within the Catholic Church together. I know you Protestants don't have any divisions, but <laughs> I'm glad they got laughter. Um, <laughs> but he has also worked extensively on the relationship between the Catholic Church and other Christian churches. Uh, for example, we have a Catholic Orthodox prayer uh, service we do twice a year. Um, he is here today. I know there's going to be a Reformation program in the Archdiocese. And... Um, he will be at tonight, uh, the uh, Archbishop's work is never done. He'll be at the uh, Atlanta Jewish uh, Center, the, at the Temple, uh, with the program Repairing the World, Understanding Our Shared Responsibility, which is the third year uh, that the Archdiocese and the AJC have put that together. So he is the perfect person to come up here and uh, to answer the question that I was so thankful I didn't have to answer, Archbishop. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, uh, for that kind introduction. And thanks to all of you for the opportunity to spend uh, a part of this day with you. Joe and Lai, the brilliant first foreign minister of the People's Republic of China, 
was once asked about the consequences of the French Revolution. He replied, it's too early to tell. <laughs> the question of today's lecture, has the Reformation been a failure, is one that we could answer in the same way. It's too early to tell. And then go home and enjoy a free evening. <laughs> Moreover, just what is this Reformation that may or may not have failed? Our question is complicated by the fact that Reformation is a singular noun, but it refers to very complex, multifaceted events and trends that profoundly affected every aspect of European life over the course of more than two centuries, 1490 to 1700. In the estimation of one of the Re Reformation's premier historians, Dur uh, Dermot McCulloch, now in two, two, 2017, as we mark the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation with Martin Luther, we naturally think of Luther when we hear the word Reformation. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that the Reformation is really the Reformations. Besides Luther, we have Zwingli, Calvin, Butcher, Besa, Munster, uh, Mutzer, Karlstad, Simons, Cramner, and yes, Ignatius Loyola. This list could go further, much further, naming people who led some particular and important reform movements during this period. Perhaps, however, our question, has the Reformation been a failure, is not unanswerable after all. Even though there were many reformers besides Luther, and many reformations besides his, each genuine reformer would have said that they did not want to found a new church, and that division was anathema to them. Rather, they wanted to reestablish the whole, true, and pure church as it had been intended by our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, amid the bewildering complexity of the various reformations of the 16th and 17th centuries, we can discern this, their common goal, and ask, did they succeed or not? Apparently, Luther never said the exact words, here I stand, I can do no other, when he had been summoned to defend himself at the Diet of Worms in 1521. But this, these phrases surely express his conviction that his own judgment trumped the authority of the church. It is fair to say that he saw himself as a prophet of a renewed church. But then his message trickled down from the clergy and nobility to ordinary people. They were delighted to learn about their freedom and dignity from Luther and took his message to mean, let's get rid of the old, tired, corrupt church. His preaching and writing fostered a new spirit of rebellion against established authority that spread rapidly. As the reform movement disintegrated and violent peasant revolts broke out in Germany in 1524, Luther himself was horrified to see what people did with his notion of Christian freedom. In fact, Luther and his fellow reformers had unknowingly faced huge obstacles in pursuit of their goal of a renewed church. On April 4, 1864, Abraham Lincoln wrote to a correspondent, I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. Luther would surely understand, uh, have understood and agreed with Len Lincoln's sentiment. In 1517, however, he did not yet fully realize that he was lighting a fuse to some explosive elements. In particular, 
the pervasive terror of God's wrath that seemed to be using an aggressive Islam as its instrument. McCulloch reminds us that southeastern Europe had been vulnerable for decades, and Hungary would be conquered in 1526. Muslims would lay siege to Vienna in 1529. So an angry God had to be placated by a vigorous, painstaking defense of the right forms of belief and practice, even against other Christians. This fear explains much of what uh, explains much of what to us may seem to be the theological hair splitting that the reformers practiced incessantly. Repeated efforts were made to heal the divisions and come to agreement. And these efforts were often spearheaded by emperors and princes who did not want their lives complicated by severe religious discord within their realms. But Luther and Zwingli could not find enough common ground when they met at Marburg in 1529. The Diet of Augsburg in the following year could not end the 12-year division of the church, despite the heroic efforts of Philip Melanchthon. Of course, his text became the Augsburg Confession, part of the foundation for a new form of Christianity. Eleven years later, the Regensburg Colloquy broke down over theological disagreements that could not be bridged. Reconciliation and reunion seemed hopeless now, and so the boundary lines hardened. After some decades of relative peace and a live and let live religious policy pursued by the Holy Roman Emperors, who were not necessarily holy, nor Roman, nor emperors. <laughs> a militant Catholic, Ferdinand II, became emperor. Stability came to an end because he wanted to make Roman Catholicism alone the religion of his realm. And so he began harassing Protestants. When his representatives in Prague were unceremoniously thrown out of, out of a window, the famous defenestration of Prague in 1618, the terrible Thirty Years' War broke out. Mercenary armies ravaged Europe, mainly but not only in German territories, killing, raping, pillaging, and looting, leaving famine, disease in their wake. Breck's powerful play, Mother Courage and Her Children, testifies to the immensity of the war's suffering and grief. So the full story of the Reformation is painful and bloody. Throughout the period, Christians despised, persecuted, tortured, and killed one another in the name of Jesus Christ. In England alone, to take just one example, more Catholics were legally murdered under Queen Elizabeth than in any other European country. England's Protestants were then martyred under Elizabeth's sister and successor, Queen Mary or Bloody Mary. And Fox's Book of Martyrs profoundly and permanently shaped the identity of the English Reformation. From an historian's perspective then, there are good reasons to say that the Reformation was a failure, a massive failure. The whole true and pure church, as it had been intended by our Lord Jesus Christ, had not come to pass. And considering the Thirty Years' War, the Reformation had made lives of people much, much worse than they would have been even with a corrupt church. After all, there was a Catholic Re Reformation that would have gone forward even without the challenges of Protest Protestantism. Now, though, let's consider the question of the Reformation's success or failure from another perspective, that of contemporary Roman Catholic Christianity. This perspective is formed by recognizing and professing Jesus Christ as the absolute mediator of salvation, 
the one in whom God has, God has offered God's own self irrevocably to the world, to use Karl Rahner's terminology. The reality of the church is more than simply a human institution, although it is certainly that. It is also the historical continuation of Jesus in and through the community of those who believe in him. In this perspective, the perspective of faith, our question about success or failure becomes more complicated. Let me tell you a story. Way back in the early 1950s, a friend of mine told me his mother found herself getting more and more anxious about the state of the world. World War II had ended in 1945, but now, not a decade later, the United States was deep into another war on the Korean Peninsula. His mother had worried about her soldier husband all during the World War. Her husband had come home safely, but now she had a son, who is my friend, and she was afraid that he too might have to go to war if the world did not change, the kind of radical change that only God could bring about. Her fear grew so great that finally she felt that she had to do something about it. She phoned the Archdiocese of Chicago and was able to get an appointment with Cardinal Stritch, then the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. After the preliminary courtesies, which be probably involved her kneeling and kissing his ring, she told the cardinal of her fears for her son and all her other sons. How can we find peace, real and lasting peace, she asked. And then she answered her own question, through prayer. And we know, she went on, that God always hears the prayers of children. So please proclaim a day of prayer, Your Eminence, a special day when not only all Catholic children, but all the children of the other churches will pray for peace. Madam, replied the Cardinal, there are no other churches. <laughs> Stritch was obviously a man of his time. In 1954, the Second Assembly of the World Council of Churches was held in Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. That is, within the Archdiocese of Chicago. President Dwight D. Eisenhower spoke to the members and urged them to actions that would summon Christians everywhere to the devotion, wisdom, and stamina to work unceasingly for a just and lasting peace. Catholics would have had to read about the president's appeal in the newspaper, since Stritch had forbidden Catholics to attend the assembly. His prohibition and his reply to my friend's mother reflected the position of the church as expressed in Pope Pius XI's encyclical Mortalium Animus of 1928. And I quote, It is clear why this apostolic see has never allowed its subjects to take part in the assembly of non-Catholics. There is, there is spent one way in which there is but there is spent one way in which the unity of Christians may be fostered, and that is by furthering the return to the one true Church of Christ of those who are separated from it. For from that one true Church of Christ, they have in the past fallen away. The one Church of Christ is visible to all and will remain, according to the will of its author, exactly the same as he instituted it. The, mysti the mystical spouse of Christ has never in the course of centuries been contaminated, nor in the future can she ever be. Prior to Vatican II, Catholics then deemed the Reformation not just a failure, but a disaster. A disaster not only on account of the untold suffering and, uh, of millions of dead, but also because it enticed people out of the one true church. And membership in that church was necessary to salvation. That same friend of mine, whose mother went to Cardinal Stritch, 
recalls his childhood fears that his dad would not go to heaven because his dad was not a Catholic. Meanwhile, however, significant developments had taken place among the Protestant churches, mainly in Europe, beginning in the late 1800s. Historians maintain that the movement began with the World Missionary Conference, which convened in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1910. Here the realization dawned more forcefully than ever before that the division which, affect, which afflicted Christianity was a serious obstacle to proclaiming the gospel. We find Pope John Paul II echoing that same conviction in his 1995 encyclical on ecumenism, Ut Unum Sent. We should not forget, however, the Chicago Lambeth Quadrennial, first adopted by the bishops of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States in 1886, and then accepted by the whole Anglican community, communion in 1888. This document was a pioneering effort to promote Christian unity by declaring what the bishops considered the four minimal conditions to achieve it. In the wake of World War I in 1925, under the leadership of the great Swedish Archbishop Nathan Solterblom, a coalition of Protestant churches informed the life and work movement. Its wide-ranging agenda covered issues which today fall under the rubric of peace and justice. Clearly, social questions had to be front and center for Christians in order to avoid another war, war like World War I. Two years later, in 1927, a coalition of 80 churches developed the faith and order movement to study the issues of doctrine and church polity that had to be faced in the quest for unity. None of these significant develops, developments moved the Roman Catholic Church to change its position. In fact, the Faith and Order meeting in 1927 prompted Pius XI's encyclical Mortalium Animus in 1928 that I just quoted beforehand. Nor did the formation of the new World Council of Churches in 1948, when faith and order joined hands with life and work, change the official Roman Catholic position about Protestants and other Christians. After all, in 1943, Pope Pius XII's encyclical Mystici Corporis Christi had identified the Church of Christ with the Roman Catholic Church. So what did change the official Roman Catholic position? Let me highlight four factors. I don't mean that this list is exhaustive, but these seem to me to be the main ones. First, the modernist crisis. In the late 19th century, some leading Catholics wanted to bring church teaching into dialogue and perhaps agreement with contemporary findings in philosophy, history, and the social sciences. Among, among other innovations, that meant the abandonment of scholastic philosophy and theology, which they now considered outdated. But Pope Pius X crafted a unitar uh, unitary system out of these various notions, called it the synthesis of all heresies and ruthlessly condemned it in 1907. The theological lines were now clearly drawn in the church. Those who trespassed the boundaries of scholastic philosophy and theology fell under suspicion or were dismissed from their teaching positions. So scholars began to devote themselves more and more to relatively safe research into the history of doctrine and of the church. These historical studies that flourished in the following decades revealed not only that tradition had indeed developed in the church, but also that the church had often tolerated 
a wider range of theological diversity than had been previously thought. This new view of tradition necessarily suggested new views of the church itself. It became harder and harder to maintain what Pope Pius XI had said, and I quote, the one church of Christ is visible to all and will remain, according to the will of its author, exactly the same as he instituted it, unquote. A second factor was Pope Pius XII's openness to the use of historical critical methods to interpret the Bible. In his 1943 encyclical, Divino Aflante Spiritu, as Catholics employed these methods more and more, they discovered not only that the Protestants had gotten there first, but also had come to similar conclusions in their research. Thus, a new vision of vast common ground between Catholics and Protestants began to appear. The third factor was the work of faithful and courageous pioneering theologians, like Paul Courier, who was chiefly responsible for our annual week of Christian unity, but the chief among them was the French Dominican Yves Congar. His book, Chrétien de Younes, which appeared in 1937, became an important text for ecumenically minded Catholics. But of course, it was constantly under suspicion by the Curia until Vatican II, where Congar's influence was immense. Finally, as ecumenical theologian Michael Fahey says, the shift from isolation to tolerance and then to admiration and collaboration was influenced by the shared trauma of the two war world wars, especially World War II. Catholics and Protestants lived and worked and endured side by side under extreme wartime conditions. This made it impossible to overlook or to dismiss the Christian faith and commitment of a sister or brother whom one had previously deemed to be hardly Christian at all. Add to this the witness of Hitler's Christian resistance. People like Martin Niemöller, Karl Barth, and the great Dietrich Bonhoeffer murdered in 1945, whose letters and papers from prison won such a wide readership across the Christian world. How could one say that they did not belong to Christ? These were the words, these were the factors that gradually dispelled the clouds of prejudice and ignorance that isolated Christians from one another and laid the groundwork for the great leap forward which the Roman Catholic Church took in Vatican II. The essence of this leap is expressed in one verb in number eight of the Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium. That verb is subsists, subsisted in the original Latin. It appears in the full famous sentence, this church of Christ constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in union with that successor. Although many elements of sanctification and, tr and of truth can be found outside of her visible structure, Lumen Gentium details the implication of this text. After recounting those many elements of sanctification and of truth, the Council says that non-Roman Catholic Christians are joined with us in the Holy Spirit. For to them also he gives his gifts and graces, and is thereby operative among them with his sanctifying power. The decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Rendent Gratio, in number four, expresses this conviction in another way. I quote, Moreover, some, even very many, of the most significant elements 
or endowments with which, which together go to build up and give life to the church herself can exist beyond the visible boundaries of the Catholic Church. The written word of God, the life of grace, faith, hope, and charity, along with other interior gifts of the Holy Spirit and visible elements. This means that all Christian churches and ecclesial communities can and must learn from one another and act accordingly. As Christians dialogue with one another and collaborate with one another, they can teach and inspire each other. In and through the quest for church unity, says the decree, and I quote, all are led to examine their own faithfulness to Christ's will for the church, and wherever necessary, undertake with vigor the task of renewal and reform. Latin reformationis, emphasized, uh, emphasis added. Thus, Pope St. Paul, John Paul II, in Ut Unum Sent, in our Article 28, says, dialogue is not simply an exchange of ideas. In some ways, it is always an exchange of gifts. And so, as the late and great ecumenist, Margaret O'Gara, insisted, the ecumenical movement is a reform movement in the church. A case which she argues in her collection of essays, the ecumenical gift of exchange, the ecumenical gift exchange. A similar insight stands behind the receptive in ecumenism associated most closely with Paul Murray of the University of Durham. In striving for the unity of the church, we go beyond mutual tolerance and understanding to ask what we see in our dialogue partner that might deepen and enrich our own faithfulness to Christ's will for the church. As we challenge and question one another, we enter more deeply, fully into the mystery of our salvation. And from that transformation comes reform. So let me offer a response to our question. Has the Reformation been a failure? If the church is enduring historical continuation of Jesus in and through the community inaugurated on Pentecost, and if the church is still in the process of reformation in a manner directly stemming from the epochal events of the 16th century, then clearly we can say that the reformation is not yet over. The question of its success or failure is premature. It is indeed, to quote Zhou Enlai, too early to tell. To be sure, Serious obstacles still lie in our way forward, such as the central issue of authority in the church, division over ethical questions, and the disagreement about the role of women. But we can and must face these together with trust in our God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation, in the church, and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. We have about 10 or 15 minutes if anyone has questions for any of our panels. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, this is for all the bishops. Um, if we see the 20th century and the early uh, the earliest decade of the 21st century being a time of uh, great strides in ecumenical theology. Um, how do we understand the way forward as social issues and cultural issues threaten to divide uh, the ELCA in the wake of 2009, the ongoing debate with the General Conference and the UMC, and even several cardinals' responses to Pope Francis? Uh, what what is the future of uh, Christian unity um, in in the wake of this new social upheaval? The law.
lot has fallen to me to start. <laughs> and so I'll go back to the last answer that I had. I think that it becomes really critical, and I heard echoes of that in the Archbishop's, uh, con uh, the last part of his remarks. It becomes more and more important that we are clear about what it is that is uh, the core of the Christian faith, that, that gospel I was talking about earlier. Because uh, so many of the fights and arguments, and I would say even during the Reformation, were about second-level things, things of second importance. But we people, I think, tend, and institutions certainly tend, to major on where, what are the differences rather than what they have in common. And we certainly have not only more in common, but more important things in common. Uh, we have to learn, and I think our Orthodox brothers and sisters have learned this uh, maybe better than we have, that we can live together as communities with significant differences of opinion about important matters, because the most important matters we agree on. Um, yeah, I think um, if I go back to what Luther was trying to do originally, which is have an academic conversation, have a conversation about these things. Um, I, you know, I mentioned the importance of just robust conversation, and the Archbishop talked about collaboration and, and finding ways that we do find the common ground, even though we may have differences in the way we may structure ourselves or the role of authority. The common ground is what is so, I, I think, so vital for our world today. We need to present that the gospel of Jesus Christ in ways that it may have a Lutheran flavor or a Wesleyan flavor, but it's the gospel and it, and it is a common ground. The only way we're going to get there, I'm convinced, is, is through dialogue and conversation. And the agreement that happened between the Lutherans and the Roman Catholic Church in 1999 did not just happen. That was years and years of conversation. Our full communion with the Lutherans took years. But it, if we do not engage in those conversations, if we break those off and begin to de demonize people who may disagree with us, then we're going to be right back where we were in the 1500s. I'd like to start with, uh, I think, a concept that we all uh, uh, use and, and I think accept. It's the concept of sin. The... The evil one, Diabolos, and that term means the one who divides. He divides. And so wherever, where the, wherever there is a, uh, an encounter with division within an ecclesial family or among ecclesial families, I, I really think that's a sign of the presence of the evil one who, who seeks to divide and to separate uh, because the experience of union is the experience of grace. And the evil one cannot endure uh, the, the union or the grace that is represented there. And so he provides all kinds of opportunities and occasions for division. I speak you know, of, of my own religious family. You cited the challenge that Francis is encountering within his own curia. Uh, it's, a div it's a divisive and I think a sinful expression that, please God, he has the courage, the wisdom, and the determination to, uh, to call it what it is. I, can I add one thing to that? Because you mentioned Darren McCulloch, the yeah. Oxford uh, Reformation scholar, who said, and, and he didn't mean by this, by the way, that the Reformation was not over important things, but the things that ended up in dividing the church, he said, is a Reformation that was a story of two bald men fighting over a comb, an ultimate <laughs> feudal struggle over issues that now seem trivial or irrelevant. But those are the kind of things that we're, we've often focused on. And if you read the writings, the polemical writings during the 16th century Reformation, it was those, now we see not so important issues that created all the heat and light and were, I think, principally the reason that 
more substantive issues couldn't be discussed by either side after a point. So I, I, I really agree with what yeah. you say, that the tendency to divide always seems so much stronger uh, than, the, than the unity that we have already been given in Christ. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. growing congregations, and the pastors that I studied intentionally um, took the middle way and said that we're going to embrace the messiness where in our congregations we will um, discuss and engage in conversation and embrace our unity in Christ and grow as a place where those conversations can take place. So in addition to fighting against uh, evil trying to divide us, I think Can I uh, use a personal example? Um, I'm a convert to Catholicism through the Catholic school system in Chicago, which was a vehicle that many, many, many African Americans followed, especially after the Great Migration, the end of the Second World War, great numbers of, of African Americans coming from the South to the, to the, to the promised land of the North. Uh, and the Catholic school system uh, welcomed, you know, countless thousands. In any event, uh, I entered the church as a uh, grammar school kid, mesmerized by Catholicism and its ritual and activity. My dad never d entered the church, and I would speak. And that's even after I, I became the Archbishop of Atlanta. My father was not a Catholic. Um, and we'd have uh, those father-son conversations. Those of you who are fathers and those of you who are sons know that, that routine. And um, I'm sure it's true of mothers and daughters, but I I'll have personal experience of fathers and sons. But one of the things that he often said, and I had no response to, was the scandal of religious wars and and, and arguments and the things of, of division. And uh, I really didn't have an argument. And I think a lot of young people, uh, the, the nuns, the, the spiritual but not religious, I think that's, that's a key obstacle that they find that it's a, it's a scandal that the, the Christian churches and organized religions in general uh, are at war with each other. I have a happy conclusion for my, at least personal. Um, my dad had a very serious uh, diabetic seizure. I, I happened to be in Chicago. I, I think it was God's grace that I was there. So I'm in the hospital. He's wired up with everything. And I looked at him and I said, Pops, I think I ought to baptize you. And he said, I think you should too. <laughs> So I was able to baptize my father on his deathbed. Uh, I don't think he would acknowledge that, he, that I won the argument. <laughs> <laughs> but he was in no position to take up that. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. I appreciated your mentioning the Regensburg Colloquy. I always thought was the apex of the opportunity yeah. for the Lutherans and the Catholics to sort of come together. And the story that I got out of it was that Melanchthon was representing Luther there and actually agreed with many of the issues and was getting very close to a point where it could come together. It goes back to Luther and, of course, it all fell apart at that point because we talked earlier about the embittered nature of Luther at, uh, at that point in his life. But the Regensburg Colloquy, I think, in some respects, set the stage for the Council of Trent, right. and for much that was going on in terms of the Catholic side, which we don't know much, much about from our side of the fence. So your, your, your lecture really opened the door for us to, to really see the, the ferment that really has gone on in the Catholic Church over the years. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Any last comments or questions?
question. Yes, ma'am. conversations I've had with a number of people who raised that question with me is uh, to focus on the positives. Yes, I mean, we confess that we have had issues. We confess that the divisions and, and sometimes the violence done to one another, uh, it's a part of our history. But then uh, I like to try to point out um, the ways in which we have been able to do amazing things for the world's people, whether it is uh, in terms of education or hospitals or uh, feeding programs. Um, there is so much that um, every branch of Christianity does uh, in the name of Jesus that gets overlooked. And t people tend to focus on... Um, you know, I, hey, I was bad about this. If 30 people walked out of a church service and said that was the best sermon I ever heard, and one walked out and said, where did you get that, and it was awful, that's the one I'm going to think about. Uh, we just had that tendency. So I like to try to point out um, that there have been positives, and the positives far outweigh. Tragic things happen, absolutely. But we've also done amazing things things in the name of Jesus in all parts of the world. So I will say two things. I think, uh, I think uh, you are right, Bishop, that you know, we do have in the church the opportunity of confession <laughs> and absolution, and maybe we should be clear with people and not try to be defensive about our history. And the second thing is one of those personal stories. I have in my living room a uh, uh, a print from uh, a, a coastal artist named Walter Inglis Anderson. He was a very good artist, if you haven't heard about him, but this is one he did called The Three Fishermen, and it's, it's just this sort of semi-abstract, uh, three people in a boat with lines in the water. And uh, that, was, that was given to me by folks in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, because they knew that the Episcopal priest, the Presbyterian pastor, and I like to go fishing together. And it made a huge impact in that community that we weren't uh, in opposition to one another or even, or even competing with one another, but that we were friends. And uh, so this year, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the Lutherans and Roman Catholics in the Archdiocese of Mobile and in the Diocese of Savannah and then Tuesday here in Atlanta have met together. And in every, and then there have been other meetings and communities uh, where, uh, to talk about the Reformation among Lutherans and Catholics and others. <laughs> and in every single one of those cases, the, the size of the congregation that showed up was way bigger than anybody expected so that in two cases they had to take the tables out so that they could get enough chairs. And people really want to see the church uh, communicating across these denominational lines that we've set up. And I think they want to see some evidence that we do believe that we are one in Christ. And, and they're, people are hungry for that. So you know, don't, we ought to make a deal out of it when we are able to do something like that. And maybe that gives a counter witness to the really bad witness we've given for at least the last 500 years. I guess I would say the first thing we have to acknowledge publicly, uh, which I suspect has been said already in this uh, day's presentations, is let's call sin, sin. Let's acknowledge uh, the fault and the failures that we all, there's, there's more than enough uh, <laughs> failure on all of our parts, and we, we need to acknowledge that. But the other thing, I, I, I think we need, to, we need to package our successes 
more effectively. Um, I, I hope I'm not offending anyone that's involved with the media, but the media, public, uh, public announcements tend to highlight the negative. I mean, the, what is it, the, if it bleeds, it leads? Well, that's true in terms of looking at the religious uh, horizons in today's world, too. So we find a lot of attention on the mistakes, the, the barbarous way that we have treated each other, and in some cases still treat each other, and, and little attention, or not enough attention, on, as, as the bishop said, uh, success stories. Perhaps we should have an ecumenical uh, a, a marketer, you know, if we could hire a PR. A ecumenical PR person, somebody from New York on Madison <laughs> Avenue that could put a good face on the good things that we're doing. Yeah. That's, that's, I'm being facetious, but, but not completely. <laughs> Seeding program is copyrighted by Emory University.